we're going to jump right in and just uh, kind of work our way down through uh, verse 23, which is a natural stopping point here. Uh, we got down through about verse 9 last time, and again, the context here, the Lord is dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes. They are challenging him. They're questioning him and as to why his apostles, his disciples don't wash their hands before they eat and so forth. And uh, he obviously he responds to them. And he, his response there in verse 6, just so we get this into our mind, he answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied, and this will be Isaiah uh, 29, of you hypocrites, as it is written. And again, again, he calls them hypocrites, and that's a great way to start the conversation. And it's a great way to answer the, the questioning here. Uh, of the issue of the tradition of the elders and the traditions of men. And he calls them hypocrites. And, and again, the Lord confronts their hypocrisy over and over and over and over again. And he does it without uh, hesitation. Matthew 23, he calls them Pharisee scribes and hypocrites. Pharisee scribes and I mean, just over and over. And again, what he's doing here is he's laying out the indictment against them is what he's doing. The, the, everybody's got this really religious view of the Lord being this meek and mild and kind of wimpy looking guy walking around. And in reality, he was completely the opposite. Uh, you know, I, I've been looking at some stuff about Paul and uh, Paul... <laughs> It's very interesting what when you listen to grace people talk about how you ought to be dealing with uh, each other or problems, you know, not each other, but in problems. And, you know, it's very funny that Paul never says, we'll just let you be because that's what you think. Rather, he says, if you preach anything other than what I preach, you're accursed. You're to be cut off. You're to be kicked out. You're to be removed. <laughs> it's a completely different thing than, oh, just huggy, lovey, dovey. And no, and what happens is, is you sacrifice sound doctrine on the altar of unity and try to being, un and it's not. It's, hey, th this is how it is. And if you don't like it, then that's your problem and you need to grow up and move on. But, and the Lord does that. And that's what he's doing here in Mark 7. He, he gets into the issue with them, and he gets into it with them right away. Verse 6, he, he's going to nail their problem. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And again, he honors me with their lips. The external activity, the, 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 the external, vain, religious, ceremonial activity that they're doing, then he says their hearts, well, the heart, that's the internal issue. Uh, the heart, that is the, the mentality of your soul. It's not the, the pump beating. It's, it's, where, it's that thinking process. And, and the issue here is internal. If you pick the internal and clean the in, internal up, then the external will follow. You can't fix it from the outside in. It's got to be fixed inside to out. And that's, so he nails them. Verse 7, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the traditions of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. What are they doing? Vain religious system. Vain worship. They lay aside God's word, and they're over here doing this thing that they're, they've, they've titled and labeled as worship. And again, even in today's modern Christianity, worship time. And they get this whole idea. You know that worship in Scripture is doing what the word of God tells you to do? That's what worship is. It's not a music. It's not the music. That's the song service. <laughs> Okay, it's not coming over here and bowing and doing all this stuff. It's, hey, what does God's word say to me? I'm going to go do that. And God says, that's a sweet smell. That's a sweet odor. 
talking about that Sunday, that's a sweet smell. Here, they're vain, empty, worthless, valueless. They've got a system of emotional worship. They're on that external drive. And he nails them. And, and again, the, the beginning of the, this vain religious system, and really this is true of us today, starts by laying aside the Word of God and going after and teaching and, and teaching and dwelling on and pursuing the traditions of the elders, the traditions of men. So if you depart from what God's written word says, then you're going to quickly fall into a vain religious performance, external driven system. Today, in the age of grace, we call that legalism, the law, where you take what God has deemed dead and you bring it back alive, to accomplish something, and it really doesn't. Verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And again, he is right on the problem. He's diagnosing their problem. He's reading their meter, as Dad would say. (laughs) He's got them. He's used Isaiah 29. He's gone in there. Again, we saw a lot of this last time. He's dissected them down. Here's your problem. Your problem, Isaiah 58. Look look over at Isaiah 58. We didn't look at that passage last time. Isaiah 58. Just think about this. When he calls their, (laughs) with their lips, they honor me. With their heart is far from me. They lay aside They got all this worship thing, this empty, valueless. Isaiah 58, look at verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of judge. They take delight in what? Approaching to God. Isn't that interesting? Where do they delight? They don't delight in doing what he's saying. They delight in the what? In the approaching. See, they they take pleasure in in approaching him rather than finding him. They don't want to find him. They just want to, how do we approach him? If you look at verse 3, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? See that issue about fasting? It's Fasting in Scripture, in Leviticus 23, is very specific when it comes to Israel. Here, they're out here doing something in a religious ceremony. We, all right, we're going to do the Adam and Eve diet for a month. You know? And it's like, oh, wow, okay, cool. You know? So what are we eating? Vegetables, veggies. You know? But what are we, we're not doing it for... A health reason or a legitimate, we're doing it for a, Paul calls it, will worship in Colossians. We're doing it for a prestige, a look, a, wow, look at those guys. Boy, look at that church. Aren't they wonderful? Oh, wow. We, wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exalt All your labors. See what they're doing? That that religious, they're on that treadmill of religion. They're just constantly, drop down to verse 13, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasures, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. See what they got to do? They got to jettison the, that old tradition of the elder stuff and go do what God tells them to do. So when you come back to Mark 7, that's what you guys are enjoying the chase. That's what he's saying there, verse 9. Full well ye reject the commandments of God that ye may keep your own tradition. You know what? That's what religion is. Let's enjoy the, the approaching, the chase. Well, what happens when you catch him? Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. 
So what do we do? We just don't catch him. We keep chasing him. We keep seeking him. There, there's a verse in Hebrews. Uh, come back. Hold on here. Look over in Hebrews. i got to find it, so just give me a second here. If you look over at Hebrews. I just had it. Where did it go? Well, it's the verse where he talks about he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, it's drawing a blank right now. Go back to Mark 7. What are they doing? They're not diligently seeking him. They're delighting in the approaching. They're delighting in the vain religion. So 7-9, full well. The whole nation, that's what I tried to show you last time when we went back into the Old Testament there, that it wasn't just the leaders, it was all of the people. It was the whole nation is off in complete and total apostasy. They've left the written word of God given to them, the oracles of God given to them. They're over here doing now the traditions of men. And he says, you guys are worried about how you're going to wash your pots and pans and hands, and yet you're going to, you completely disregard, you nullify, you cause the word of God to have no impact on people's lives. And you do that, the whole nation is doing that. That's why when John the Baptist comes and when the Lord comes, what are they calling out of the nation? That little flock, that believing remnant, that little group of believers that God knows is there because His Word is there and people do believe His Word, and He begins to call out that little flock. It starts under the ministry of John the Baptist, then it moves into the Lord Jesus Christ and His earthly ministry, and then, and then it moves over here into the, uh, the apostles. That thing in Acts 2 where Peter tells those guys, get out of that untoward generation, get out of that apostate nation, that's where they're at. And what the Lord has done here is he has completely deemed, he has indicted the whole nation as apostate. You're not getting this. You, and by the way, you will not get it. You're blinded. And that's what he's doing here in, in verse 9. Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Now he's going to give an illustration. And he's going he's gonna to move and, and he's going to draw a picture here of, the, of, of really the impact of falling for and following the traditions of the elders. Here's what's going to happen if you follow the traditions of the elders. And here's what's going to happen when you follow what God's Word says. And he's going to draw this picture. Verse 10, for Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now, he, he's quoting Exodus 20 uh, and, uh, and Exodus 21. Paul in Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, for it's the first commandment with promise. And so the idea here is that issue of honoring your father and mother. If you don't, you're going to get cursed. you got a curse coming your way. But if you do, then you're obeying God's word and things will be working out. Now, the honor here that he's talking about, honor thy father and thy mother, and, and really what, he's, what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 6 to somewhat, but more of a lesser degree of honoring as an adult's going down is, here you have mom and dad, they're in retirement age, and they're having a hard time, and what do you do as, as child? You go take care of them. That's the idea, the taking care of the, uh, of, of the parents. So watch verse 11. What does the tradition of men do? But ye say, all right, what does God's word say? Take care of mom and dad, honor mom and dad. And if you don't, you're going to get a curse. But what does the tradition say? If a man shall say to his father and mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be uh, profited by me, he shall be free. Now, think, 
korban, a gift given to God. So you got a guy here, he comes in, he's got mom and dad, and he says, here's a gift. And what the tradition of the elder says is you give them the gift, then you are free of all future responsibilities. You don't have to take care of them. You let them go. You are free of any further future obligation. Well, wait a second. <laughs> what happens if mom and dad live another 20-something years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever? Nope, you're free. So what does is, what is the Word of God say? If you don't do it, you're going to get a curse. The tradition comes along and says, we don't like that word curse. We don't like the word hell, so we change it to Hades, you know, because everybody uses that word. <sighs> okay. We don't like this word, so we're going to redefine it. We're going to redo it. So now if you just go in and take care of mom and dad, give them a big love offering, a big gift, then you are free. The tradition, verse 12, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. See, they take mom and dad, they give them some money, and no matter what happens after that, they are free. Now, that's not what the law said. That's not what Exodus says. That's not what, uh, well, let's see, that's not what Deuteronomy 21 says. That's not what Leviticus says. It says you take care of mom and dad. That's your job. That's, that is the, one of the essence of being born into the family. So they've taken the commandment, and they say, well, just give them a gift, and you're free to go. By the way, you know what? The law never says anything about giving mom and dad a gift. It just says take care of them. You're obli obligated to take care of them. By the way, Paul, to the church there in 1 Timothy 5, talks about widow or widows. But the widows in the church taking care of widows within their, their, the local assembly, but the widows have a criteria on them to be taken care of by the church. One is that they don't have a retirement fund, i.e., the kids... You know, they don't have a big inheritance. Number two is that that widow has done nothing but worked in the church. That's why she doesn't have the retirement fund. People ask me all the time, what's your retirement fund? Glory. I, I got a little bit from working in the bus yard. That's it. You know, my financial guy, I was talking to him the other day. And he's like, I'm a little worried about you, Charles, because, you know, you don't have much. I said, that's okay. I don't need much. You know, and, you know, Linda's got hers and stuff over the years. That's fine. But if something were to happen to me, she doesn't have enough to continue on. So what would happen? The ch local church would come in and help her. Why? Because sh she's dedicated her life to the ministry. That's what you do. Here in the law, you don't do that. You take care of them regardless. And yet, what did the traditions do? You can go free. Go ahead. It's okay. No further obligation, no further taking care of. So then what's the result? Verse 13, making the word of God of what? None effect through your traditions which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. You see, they take the commandment of God's word, and, and he uses the illustration of honoring the father and mother, and you know what they? You know what he says? You took that commandment of honoring father and mother, and you made it of no effect. You destroyed the commandment of promise. You destroyed what it was designed to do in your life. It was designed, by the way, to do in their life so that their kids would grow up with grandma and grandpa. That's what it's for, because grandma and grandma and grandpa were to teach their kids, and their kids to teach their kids, and then grandpa and grandpa could step in and help with the little ones. And then if they live long enough, the great-grands, see there's a whole family dynamic here of protection of the truth. That's the goal. That's what it's there for. And yet, what did the tradition say? We'll take care of them. We'll take care of them. So now what do we got? We got an old folks' home out in the back end of the temple. Because we have to take care of them. You gave us a nice gift. We appreciate that. We'll put a wing on for your name, you know. 
But that's what religion does. It just continually does that. Come over, come back to Proverbs 28. <clears throat> Proverbs uh, 28. This, again, what have they done? They've taken the benefit of the commandment and they've made it of none effect. And this is something uh, in Israel, again, about mom and dad and stuff that's of great importance. And uh, it, the issue of honoring father and mother was never held in low regard. It was always held in high regard. Uh, Proverbs 28, look there at verse 24. Whosoever robbeth his father or his mother and saith, it is no transgression. Well, that's just what they said. That's what the traditions of the, of the elders just said. You're free. Don't worry about it. There's no transgression here. Just give them a gift and walk. Just give them a Corbin. Just give them a gift and, and go away. Now, keep reading. The same is the companion of a destroyer. That's what they're doing. That's what the traditions of men has done. What did they, they took what, what the benefit of that commandment and they made it of no impact, not honoring father and mother. And yet, if you don't do that, the religion says you're good to go, you're free, it's okay, you gave them a gift, we're all right. Why would you give them a gift? Well, that's what, we, that's what we do at our church, is we do that. The Word of God says, no, you've made the Word of God, you've made the commandment, 713, of no effect, no impact. Again, how did you do it? You laid aside the commandment of God's Word. And you went over here and you decided to follow the tradition of man. So what happened? What happens when you lay it aside? Well, you make it of none effect. No impact, no life, no value. Uh, come on, Hold on uh, to Mark 7. Come over to 1 Thessalonians 2. Uh, Sunday, we were in the Acts, in, in our Roman study, and I was sh reading there in Acts 17 about those in Berea. These in Berea were the Jews there that got into the Word and searched it out. Well, they're in Thessalonica, and everybody says, well, don't be like the Thessalonians, be like the Bereans. No, I'd rather be like the Thessalonians, thank you. Because what did they do? 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. So when they heard Paul preach, they don't have the written word as far as Paul's epistle. What did they have? They got the Old Testament. They acknowledged it as what? The word of God. They didn't question Paul. Now, I know the Bereans do, and they're searching it out to see if it's so, and I got that, and, and you should. You shouldn't just take a guy's word for it. You ought to search it out, okay? But then he says, But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that, what? That believe. Come over to Philemon, chapter 6. Philemon verse 6, sorry, Philemon verse 6. That issue of having an impact. Tradition, religion, vain religious uh, ceremonial system, performance, external performance, takes the word of God and just lays it over there, comes in and let's, we're going to do it this way. Philemon verse 6, Paul talking to Philemon says, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. See that may become effectual? That's, that's describing what's inside of you working out, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. You believe the word of God, what's it going to do? effectually. It has an effect. It impacts. That's its design. Come, come over to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. There's a design in God's Word that 
will work in works inside of you first and then outward inside out works inside your heart with the heart man believe and then it works out look at philippians 2 and look at verse 13 for it is god which worketh in you he doesn't work on you externally he works internally both to will and to do of his good pleasure do all things without murmuring and disputings. Notice the, go back to 713, they take the word of God, they take the commandments, he uses this illustration, a, a really a great illustration of honoring father and mother, something that is in the bedrock of the nation. And he says, you tell a guy, make a donation to the church in the name of, a memorial, a memor uh, yeah, a memorial, and then you're free to go. The law says, nope, you're not. You're, you you got to take care of them all the way down to the end. But what did we do? We nullified that commandment. We nullified the benefit of having grandma and grandpa around the kids for the extent of their time. So the beginning of obedience to the traditions of the elders is the departure from the Word of God and what the Word of God says. Now, again, the motivation can be whatever it is, but the function, that's the function here. What did we do? We've left. And the moment you move towards trying to master the spiritual things by an external activity, okay? It's called mysticism. That's what it's called. Mysticism is, is you're trying to have a spiritual effect, impact on someone by performing a physical action. The moment you do that is the moment that you turn everything into idolatry and covetousness and you move it away from. You see, the heart of the issue is what? The heart. How do we fix the external? What are they trying to do in Mark 7? They're trying to wash with pots and pans, get the defilement off of them. They're doing something external, and he's going to tell them here now, it isn't external, it's internal. And you've got to fix the internal. When you're not believing the Word of God and you're over here doing this, you've lost the battle. And, that, and so, therefore, what do you do? You go off into apostasy. And again, you can run the parallels with you and I today. Uh, look over at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, again, I have been thinking about this here of late, and it's, and it's sad and it's one of the, the characteristics of the age of grace, and that is the, the leaving of the word of God rightly divided. Look at 2 Timothy 1. Look at verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The testimony of our Lord is, what he get, is the message that he gave Paul, Romans to Philemon. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't, don't try to put it over there in the corner and hide it. But, I'm sorry, nor of me his prisoner. Somebody says, you know, we, we had that wedding across the street. The re reception was here, was across the street, and they were using the restrooms in the front of the building, and they were in parking, using the parking lot to park in. Because they, I mean, there must have been a hundred and something people here, and they had two food trucks and all this stuff. I mean, just, so they had asked if they could use it, and I didn't care, and I got work to do, so sure, I'll just do it Saturday. So we were here, but it was interesting. I would go out and make sure that everything was tidied up a little bit periodically, and I hear people talking, because that board out there has got all the Am I Going to Heaven tracks on it. Because <laughs> they were stand on that side looking at waiting for the bathroom to open so what are you reading zero step how to get to heaven in zero steps and a couple people took a cup you know one or two and then they would read it and then put it back you know 
and nobody's looking. And I would stand here and go, hey, you know, <laughs> make them feel real good. But no, what, what, don't be afraid of that. Don't, don't me, but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. I love that. See, it's not, this isn't about you. It's about his life. It's about the life that we learn about in his word. The testimony of the Lord. Here's his word. And as you leave the word of God, you're going to naturally drift into religion and religious activity. And the first step of moving away from that personal connection that we have with God, the first step in, in, in leaving that, moving away from that, is moving away from the Word of God. How do you know God, God sits outside of the time-space con continuum? He, he, does, he exists regardless of what happens here. But how does he reveal himself? In the Word, in his Word. 66 books, here he is, boom. And if I'm going to have a contact point with him, I have to have it in his Word. I can't have it over here in a bunch of hoodly do mysticism. It's right here. And when I leave the Word and I go over here, you know what I lose? I lose the contact with him. But what does religion say? No, you come over here and do this and you'll have contact with him. You're trying to do something to have a spiritual connection and it doesn't work that way. It, you're not designed for that to work that way. The word of God isn't designed for it. So don't allow, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get caught up in this either. Israel did. The Lord's indicting them back here in Mark 7. You guys are guilty. You're in complete, total apostasy. Because what are they doing? They're focusing on the form, what it looks like, rather than the functioning of the Word of God. And this, this, rather than looking at the source of that internal relationship that we have with the life of Christ through His Word, they had the same opportunity. They have the same access to the life of Christ. It's just in their program. What'd they do? They left the Word. And they're over, oh, but no, no, we haven't, Rick. We, we, we use the Bible. World's most greatest, the world's most dangerous doctrine is to be scriptural but not dispensational. So that's what they're doing, and, and we have to be careful as well to not be focused on the form, the outward activity, the outward structure of everything, but rather to be focused in on the internal. Where does God work? He, he works in you to do His will and His good pleasure. He's working inside of you. And again, the challenge of today in the age of grace is the issue of legalism. And what is legalism? That outward performance system. And Paul's, Paul says, no. The Lord looks at him and says, no. The issue is your heart, the internal. And when you have an external performance system instead of a faith-based system that trusts in what God has done for you, what he's said to you, what he's, what he's going to accomplish in you, then You've got the issue of law versus grace again. I'm talking about today. And that's what you have. So the focus, and by the way, the focus of the law is on the external. If you do that, if you obey and, and do, then I'll bless you. And if you don't, then I'm going to curse you. And what did the traditions of the men do? They come, of the elders, what do they do? They come right in and they take it. And today in the age of grace, instead of it's a grace faith issue, now it's a law works thing. And they begin to meld it. And, and again, we've talked over the years here about you know where we sit in, in our world today and form follows function. I've heard that all my life growing up. Form, what you do, 
follows what? Functioning, the functioning of the Word of God, rightly divided, working in you, the life of Christ, the life of the Word of God. So you've got to have that first before you can go do this over here. A couple of months ago, well, wait a minute, this is April? All right, a year ago, That's because that was last April, May. I had a conversation with a gentleman right over here in the park, and he was asking me for a little helping money. So I didn't have any. I don't. Who carries cash anymore? I don't. I, I do tonight, but I did. Usually I don't, because you couldn't touch anything. So you had to. I I got dinner tonight, and the, I ate at a place I'm not supposed to eat at, Canes. So, the lady ha- holds the little thing, and she's like, "Just stick it in there." And I'm like, "Well, you can stick it." And she goes, "I can't touch it. They won't let me." And I'm like. Dude, don't you know they re- released all the mandate? It is April 20th. It's okay. She's like, it doesn't matter. I can't. So you hold it in there till it beep. You know, well, so we're talking to him, and I, he's like, well, why, does, why don't you at the church have a soup kitchen idea? I said, well, one, the city won't let us, because I've already talked to them about it years ago. They won't let us, because they don't want the homeless issue hanging out and so forth. They just don't want the neighborhood done. I don't, okay. But the issue of like the soup kitchen isn't the fu- isn't the function. See, the motivation to have the soup has kitchen has to come over here from the life of Christ and the life of the Word of God working in you. So we got the function going, and now we go do it in the form. See, the form that you take follows the function that you already have inside of you. And again. What are these guys doing? Mark 7, they've put the form as the issue, and they don't have the function. Now watch verse 14. We've got to get moving here. And then, and when he had called all the people unto him, so the Pharisees have left. Now he's got everybody around him. Okay, he's left dealing. I, actually, I shouldn't say they have left. He has left dealing with them. Let me say it like that. He calls everybody else together. And he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. So he's going to give them some understanding. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. So where does the defilement come from? By the way, that's what they're trying to clean up in the traditions of the elders is the issue of defilement. If you wash your hands, yesterday I was painting on my old truck, doing some touch-up stuff and get uh, prep work, and I came in and my hands were, they weren't, this, they weren't clean at all. Because I, I forget to put gloves on and I just get going. You know, and I'm sitting out there, and I'm in my good glasses. I don't, it's like, oh, man. You know, now i got to clean my glasses. And then, you know, and I'm not in a, my jeans or anything, but I'm not in my, my paint, my goof-around shorts. I'm in pretty good shorts. Uh, now, now they're goof-around shorts, you know. Got to paint them, you know. So, but, but what are you, so I go in, and I use soap, and I get clean because it's time to eat dinner. Now, I get clean because... They're dirty. There's a defilement. Notice what he says. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. So where does the defilement come from? Inside or outside? Inside. And that's the point. That's the problem. That's what they're missing. They're missing the heart problem. Nothing without Outside of you is going to come in and defile you. The defilement starts inside. What you eat isn't going to defile you. But what comes from within, that's what's defiling you. Now watch what he does, verse 16. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. Well, first of all, it's not a parable. Okay? They ju- they, so they've missed something here. 
they have missed a real obvious truth here that he's laying out on them. Now, he, verse 18, And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? See, they're missing the point. What's the point? The defilement is inside of you. It isn't outside. It isn't in the washing of the pots and pans. It's over here in, in, the, in the internal fortitude of man. Don't you get that? Now watch what he does. Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? He said it twice now. <laughs> because it entereth not into his heart but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. Now, think about this. When I ate canes tonight, that was exterior food. It went into my mouth. It went down my esophagus, into my stomach. And then now it's working its way down through the intestines. And maybe later tomorrow or sometime, we'll be in the restroom. Okay? None of that entered my body. All of that is in the digestive tract, which is a chute, if you will, a, a passageway. Now, the body's doing stuff with the food. What's it doing? Pulling out the good and the fat because it shouldn't have had it. You know, it's like, oh, I haven't had French fries in a while or the Texas toast. Oh. And then I'm like, oh, not, I'm feeling it right now. It's like, oh, okay, shouldn't have had that. Should have went over and had soup. Why? I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, or what's up here, Perfect Pair Bistro. Should have gone in there and had a little, nah, I can't, uh, it's like, uh, you know. Okay. That's the point. You know what he's doing? Guys, don't you get this? Nature provides for the cleansing of the physical body. Nature has provided a wonderful way to get rid of whatever you eat. You put it into your mouth, it's outside of your body, it's kept, it's all, always outside of your of your body. It's never, it, and you just, hello, you guys, and they're like, well, tell us the parable. There's no, there's no parable here. You know, in a parable, when he talks, when he talks in parables, it is obvious. It isn't, this is obvious he's not talking in a parable. And he says, hey, look, guys. It goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. A third time he said this. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blaspheme, pride, foolishness. Thirteen things in that list. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So, again, actually fourth time now, where's the defilement coming from? From within. It's a heart issue. The external, but again, his point is, is that when you guys see that vain, religious, external, ceremonial system going on over there that's trying to come along and keep you from being defiled, you've missed the point. That isn't the issue. The issue is for from within, out of the heart of men. It's what's going on inside of you. Where does the activity come from? Where, not the, where does the defilement come from? Not in the activity you're doing. It comes from inside. And that's what they're doing here. When you see all that ceremony, when you see all that going on, you're, they're missing the boat. They've missed the issue. The issue is the heart of men. Now, notice in verse 21, For from within... So that ought to register a verse in Proverbs in your head, Proverbs chapter 4. So go run over there, Proverbs chapter 4. <clears throat> Again here, the key to understanding how we have been created to function is critical here. 
and how that we've been made and how God made those three parts of you. I'm not going to draw the dude on the board. <laughs> it's funny. They got a picture of me. On, I don't know if you, and, they, and I've got the guy head in the body, and there's nothing there yet except for me. It looks pretty funny. Mark did a good job with that picture. You know, it's on the website. So, uh, or on Facebook, sorry, not the website. Look at Proverbs 4, look at verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep the what? Thy heart. The mentality of your soul. Now, let's think about our makeup. He's not talking about the heart pump, the, the organ, the boom, 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 boom. Romans 10.10, 10, with the heart man, what? Believes unto righteousness. The, the, in your soul, one of the, your heart, is, it, it, you can also call it your mind. You have, you have a, your spirit, which is your mind, thinking process. But your soul has a mind, has a heart, has a thinking process as well. So in your soul, one of the functions of your heart, in, again, in our makeup, is to come in here and have a thinking process, a mind. So I, I'm, I'm tempted to write, and I won't. So think about it. Your spirit and mind, your soul has a mind and a, a heart and a will and a conscience and emotion. Your body has emotions. And it has your five systems and, you know, the, all those biological things that I failed in biology at least three times that I can think of how many times I took that class. Okay. So you have that. So the connection between your spirit and your soul is the mind, the thinking process. The connection between your soul and your body is emotions because your soul looks at what you're learning in your thinking process, makes a decision to believe it, and then tells your emotions to go tell the body it's time to go to work. Move. Movement. Emotion. Go, go to work. And then your body goes to work. Okay? So when you notice what he says, keep thy heart with all diligence. Let's keep our thinking processes, our minds settled for out of it, the heart, the thinking processes, the mind, comes what? The issues of life. So where does all the capacity of life, of living, where does it start? It starts in your heart. Your emotions then respond to what you're believing, and they cause the body to go carry out the activity. So if I'm going to fix, if I want to fix the defilement, I need to fix the inside, and that'll clean up over here in, in whatever I'm doing. Follow that? That's what we're doing here. Come over to chapter 23 of Proverbs and verse 7, 23, 7. So when he says, when you, when you come into the Word of God and you believe what it says, you embrace it. When he talks about the life of Christ that liveth in me, right now, in the flesh, that's not a metaphor for something spiritually over here. That's a reality of who you are in the moment right now, present possession. You believe that, you embrace that, then you know what it's going to do? His life then is going to come over here and clean up your life, clean up your activity. Follow that? Starts here, but you have to do what first? And out of the heart are the issues of life. Here they come. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Notice the, that verse carefully. For as he, what, thinketh where? In his heart, so is he. So when you go to Mark 7, and you've got fornications, evil thoughts, uh, adulteries, murders, thefts, all this wickedness here, that's what man is. 
You see, out of the internal thinking of the heart come the issues of life, the activity of life, and what sits inside of man. Go back to Mark 7. What's, he, what's the Lord describing here? Sinful man. See, so man, the yeah, human nature, here it is, the old sin nature, we would call it. All of the capacities of life start in your heart, in your thinking. Your emotional response to what your mind and your heart, you're thinking, again, emotions are stupid, they're dumb, you know. Uh, if you were a Suns fan, you would be crying after last night. I could care less, but you would be crying. Okay, bummer. Oh, he hurt himself. Okay, you know, not to make fun of the guy got hurt. I don't know who did. I just heard somebody got hurt, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I was busy today. But what is Christ talking about? He's like, look, guys, that vain religious system has missed the point. I won't want you to miss the point. By the way, in Mark 7 and verse 16, if any man have ears to hear, what? Let him hear. That's the point. The real issue is the heart. While the religious leaders are out there making it all about the external, they're missing the real issue, and that's the heart issue. That's the internal. And what the Lord's doing here is, look, here's how man was made to function. You're not going to change that. Here's how he was made to function. You get the heart right, then all the external stuff will fall right into place. So in verse 21 and 22, you've got 13 things there. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So what does that mean about your heart? It means Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. That's what that means. Jeremiah 17 and verse number 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. We quote it all the time, but we don't do a very good job of it because we usually just butcher it up and we forget really the last bit of this. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And that's usually where we stop. But the end of that verse is the, is the punchline. Who can know it? That means you don't know your own heart. That means if you are put in the right situation at the right time, at the specific moment, you know what you could do? You don't know what you would do. You could do evil, and more than likely you will do evil. Or you could do good. Come on, come back over to Luke 11. Luke 11. You see, your heart... You, again, you don't know your heart, but Hebrews 4.12 says somebody else does know your heart. We'll get there in just a second. Look, Luke 11.13. Now, the Lord is talking here. Watch verse 13. If ye then, comma, being evil, comma, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Notice verse 13. His assumption is what? They're evil. See that? If ye then, being evil, give good gifts, knowing how to give good gifts. You see, he, his assumption, his assumption of man is that man is evil. Not good. Not potentially good. Not will stoke the God life in you and the fly, not any of that mystical nonsense. It's actually idiotic. It's, it's illogical. Comes right off of the, anyway. He looks at man as being what? Evil. Now, come over to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. And look at verse 12. Because what did Jeremiah 17 say? What's the point? The Lord's looking at the Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. You guys say one thing. You're doing something else. You're, you, you say you're following the Old Testament and everything, but you're not. You're following the traditions of men. 
You're on an external performance system to try to clean up the defilement. It's interesting that they know that they are defiled. They know they're sinners. But they're trying to clean it up. Paul says it, Romans 9, they're seeking their own righteousness. By the what? Not by faith, but by the law, the works of the law. That's what they're doing. The Lord's nailing them here in Mark about it. And he says, okay, guys, you're, you're missing it. It's internal. It's a heart issue. It's inside of you. But Jeremiah 17 says that you, the heart, who can know it? Well, look at Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of, of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. The only thing that can split you up the three components up is the Word of God. By the way, that means you have all three components. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body for all those who think otherwise. The Word of God can do what? Come in and... Now watch the rest of that verse. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Go back to Mark 7. What's the first step off into apostasy? Full well rejecting the commandments of God. Why? Because the word of God is what's peeling you, it's reading your meter. When you study that book, it reads you. And it discerns the thoughts and intents of your heart. But wait a minute, Rick. Jeremiah 17 said, who can know it? Who knows it? The Lord does. What did he say in Luke 11? You're evil. That's who you are. That's just how you can not see that, how you cannot embrace And you can just, oh, no, you're going to do this. You know, it's just ridiculous. When evil shows up, you know what it produces in your life? Luke, Mark 7, verse 21 and 22, the list. That's what's in man. There's no power to change this. There's no power in you to change that heart. The only place that there's power to change your heart is in the gospel. It is the power, Romans 1.16. I always, I can never get the verse started. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Where's the power of God? 1 Corinthians 1, it's in the preaching of the cross. There it is. So if I'm going to change my heart, where do I have to make sure I'm at? I'm in the Word of God. I'm in the Word of God rightly divided. (laughs) And I'm over here in Christ. Israel had that opportunity. They have Christ in their presence. And what do they keep doing? Full well ye reject. Full well ye reject. Now, go back to Mark 7, if if you haven't gone yet. And I want to do something with you real quick. I got a note in my Bible about this, and it's something that we got a few minutes before the hour. (laughs) We'll pick up next time in the list and work our way down through the rest of the chapter, okay? At least that's the goal. Look at Mark 7, and look at verse 19. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly... And goeth out into the draught. You know what the draught is. That's the, the restroom, okay? The dung, okay? Purging all meats. Now, do you see the end of that? Purging all meats? Now, every new Bible changes that verse. Messes it up, okay? Now, watch this. New American Standard Bible. Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. Parenthesis. Thus he declared all foods clean. Wait a second. What does that mean? That means the law, the, 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 the Levitical order of food and the clean and unclean is gone. See that? New, NIV. Uh, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body, parenthesis, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. we got a problem with Acts 10, don't we, with Peter 
and the sheet going to Cornelius and don't call clean and unclean and all that. We got us a problem here in the New Bible. Uh, New King James Version. Oh, you know, that's the best one out there now. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all food. Ooh, that's the New King James. And what is it? It aligns up with the New Bibles. Why? Because it's in the New Bibles. It lines. How about, uh, oh, here you go, the message. I love the message. Um. Are you being willfully stupid? Don't you see that what you the new mess the message uses no uh, reference points like seven nineteen it doesn't say that okay it doesn't enter into your heart but your stomachs works its way through the intestines and is finally flushed parenthesis that took care of dietary quibbling Jesus was saying that all foods are fit to eat. So Mark is full of those, by the way. Mark 1, verse 2, prophets, Isaiah, Malachi. Then they go over to Mark 16. The end of that passage is a no-go, can't do that. So here again, what do we have? We have religious, vain religious system, and what are they doing? Moving away from the commandments of the Word of God that tells Israel you can't eat clean, are unclean, you got to you got clean, and if clean touches unclean, clean is now unclean, and all of that law, why? Why would these books say that? Because what do they want to have? They want to have a little bacon with their eggs. They want to have a little this and a little that, because what do they believe they, who do they believe they are? Israel. They believe they're spiritual Israel. Well, wait a minute. If you're spiritual Israel, then you have a dietary rule. Yeah, but he really wasn't saying that, Rick. Come on. He was just saying, you know, what is the purifying all meats, by the way? That's what your body does to the food. It purifies it. It keeps the good and expels the bad. Do you know that if you ate rotten food, you know what your body would do? Expel it. We call it food poison, right? You know, it's coming out one one end or the other. Why? Cuz your body is made to do that. That's the purifying all meats just by the way. It has nothing to do with keeping and destroying the law. That's what these new bibles do by the way. Why? Because they've got an agenda to say we're spiritual Israel, we're replacement Israel. And by the way, you can eat whatever you want because, see, Jesus really, I love that message. That ended all dietary squabbling. Really? Okay. The passage is critical because it focuses in on the answer to the vain religious system that is focusing on the external and not the internal. And the internal has to do with God's Word coming in and changing the heart. And that change internally, that cleaning up, that cleansing internally, that's the life that's to then go and live out through them. And that's why Israel was in complete and total apostasy, because they had laid aside God's Word, and, it, and thus killing its ability to work in their life because of that okay now next time we'll start in verse 21 get go through the list and then we'll look at the last two uh, pictures here or, or two um, miracles in the passage as he begins again really to deal with and describe man's heart and what's going on and and he lays it out okay Whew. the hour's up all right all right, Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for the study in your word. We thank you that we can take it and put it into, the, into our thinking and the details of it, and we can bring it into our lives and rejoice in it and give you the praise and the glory. In your name we pray.